herd men into clusters. Then mortars could literally rain death down on them. But both the Central and the Allied powers were developing another weapon that would prove both physically and psychologically effective. A weapon that was nearly invisible and lighter than air. Although the flamethrower was developed and used during the First World War, it was a technology that made no strategic contribution. It frequently malfunctioned, often enveloping the two-man crew in flames. World War I tech will return on Modern Marvels. Chemical weapons were by far the most insidious technology of the First World War. Large-scale chemical warfare began in World War I, but the concept was around much, much earlier. Even during the American Civil War, there were concepts of employing a chlorine-type shell. But each time, the concept was rejected because it was thought to be against warfare. Germany had no such qualms during the First World War. There was the 1899 Hague uh, Convention that said you cannot use a shell that the sole purpose was to disseminate a toxic gas. So to get around that agreement, they mixed a high explosive with a chemical agent. Early on, both sides attempted to lace grenades with non-lethal harassing agents, like tear gas. Tear gas is known as a lacrimate, which means it irritates the tear ducts, causing them to tear and obstruct vision. But any chemical agent must gently saturate the air to be effective. The first use of chemical warfare in World War I was tear gas. The Germans used it first, but the French didn't notice. I guess the wind was too high. The Germans then used it against the Russians. It was too cold. The tear gas froze. After these false steps, the German military intensified its efforts, developing lethal gas for use in mortar shells. It was aided by a chemist named Fritz Haber. Haber was a leading scientist and academic whose work in chemistry was world-renowned. A deeply patriotic Prussian, he pioneered the use of chlorine and later phosgene as a weapon. Chlorine and phosgene are respiratory agents. They attack the lungs and the, the victims wind up actually drowning in their own bodily fluids. The Germans first used chlorine on the battlefield of Ypres, Belgium, in 1915, as they were attempting to push through the British and French lines. They waited until the wind was blowing toward the French to prevent any gas from floating back over their own troops. The first attack was very psychologically effective in that the average French soldier did not know what to expect and saw this cloud coming towards them. At first they thought maybe the German trenches were on fire and there was just smoke. But once they smelled it and got gassed by it and got affected by it, the word spread very quickly. Terrified soldiers fled to escape the sinister yellow cloud as it floated toward their position. The gas may have cost the British as many as 5,000 lives. But the Germans did not capitalize on their success because they failed to follow up on the attack. The Allies ultimately blocked their advance and pushed them back. Shortly after Ypres, both sides began hurling chemical agents at each other. It was a chemical arms race as each side attempted to develop more effective weapons. But launching enough poison to create a cloud sufficient to saturate the air to lethal levels was a technological challenge. 75 and 155 millimeter artillery shells were long range and carried a lot of agent into the trenches but it could take hundreds of shells to create a cloud. Once again, chemist Fritz Haber offered his expertise. Fritz Haber decided that one way was to simply use the chlorine in a chemical cylinder. Attackers could launch 20 to 50 times more gas in the cylinder than they could inside the much smaller shell, which also had explosives taking up space inside it. Launching the cylinders was effective, but it was a clear violation of the Hague Convention. Clifford Holliday remembers the first time he was gassed during a battle. It was a foggy night, and when they turned that gas loose, it just stayed right on the ground. But by 1916, Holliday and his comrades were now equipped, however poorly, to counter the effects of the creeping gas cloud. The first gas mask we had 
was a piece of square chamois cloth soaked in this chemical, and it was in a, a rubber lined bag with a zipper on it, and then when you run into that, you just hang it over your nose. Ammonia and other chemicals in the cloth neutralized the acid passing through. Within a short time, however, defense technology improved, providing soldiers with masks that included charcoal filters carried on the back that neutralized the poison. This is one of the later gas masks. The design had this hood that fit over the face, had the lenses that protected the eyes, and this hose which attached to a canister. This is the pack that carried it, and inside were a metal canister. The material that filtered the air was in this canister. But the bulky gas mask seriously reduced a soldier's effectiveness, making it awkward to aim a gun. And filtering agents did nothing to protect against so-called mustard gas, which wasn't a gas at all, but a sticky, persistent liquid. Mustard gas is a blister agent. It won't necessarily kill you, but it will rot your flesh, and it's also a pretty horrible thing. After mustard gas was introduced in 1917, soldiers had to be covered in waterproof clothing that protected their skin. That prevented exposure to the non-lethal but extremely painful mustard agent. All of this was difficult on the troops, but gas technology didn't add up to much strategically. Gas played no decisive role in any battles of the First World War. Gas masks kept most from dying, and subject to meteorological whims, gas was simply too unreliable. It just made everybody more miserable and had some casualties, but didn't, it was not decisive. Though gas injured more than a million soldiers, it killed fewer than 100,000, representing less than 1% of the war's death toll. Germany's Fritz Haber is not listed among those 100,000, but it's hard not to think of him, the father of chemical weapons, as a victim of his own misguided patriotism. His wife, who was also a chemist, was so horrified by what he did that she committed suicide. She couldn't live with it. And the ultimate irony was he was run out of Germany in 1933 when Hitler took over because he was Jewish and the Germans had no use for him anymore. A young Adolf Hitler was hospitalized during the First World War after being temporarily blinded by a poison gas attack. World War I Tech will return on Modern Marvels. The development of the submarine may have been the most important technological advance of World War I. But though the submarine evolved into a formidable weapon during the war, early examples had existed for nearly 200 years. You can look at a wide variety of water vehicles that can be called submersibles all the way back to the turtle which uh, attempted an attack on a british ship during the revolutionary war robert fulton pioneered some uh, steam propelled variations on the submarine during the 19th century and the europeans did so as well but the father of the modern submarine was an irish-born american named john holland who during the 1880s perfected a way to make a vessel easily submersible and truly maneuverable underwater Holland used tanks of water and compressed air to raise and lower the sub. He created a company which still builds submarines today, the Electric Boat Works. He sold them to England. The design was widely copied. Initially, they were powered by gasoline engines while on the surface and electric battery-driven engines underwater. Two different types of engines were needed because internal combustion engines required oxygen and could only be used on the surface. Battery-powered electric engines did not need oxygen, so were used underwater. Gasoline engines were initially used for the surface engine, but they were prone to explosion in the confines of a small vessel. The noxious gases that they emitted made the living quarters all but uninhabitable. What they gradually discovered was that the diesel engine and the fact that uh, diesel oil is less immediately combustible than gasoline. Well, the diesel engine was far, far better propulsion source for surface propulsion, and that they would use batteries for submerged propulsion. And of course, while they were on the surface, they could recharge their batteries employing the diesel engines. Although it was an Irish-born American who developed the modern submarine, it was Germany that established itself as a leader in sub-technology throughout World War I. 